Well, Razorback fans, it looks like Arkansas has a new offensive line coach, and it's somebody with a familiar name. But is it the good hire that everyone's hoping for? Well, let's talk about it. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 1037 The Buzz and 1037thebuzz.com. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. Hope everybody's had a wonderful weekend, as I know there were a lot of things to get to, and especially in the football side of things, we'll have some basketball stuff too, and I don't normally talk about national college football news unless it's Razorback related, but I think that there is something pretty significant when it comes to the playoff, and and we'll dive into that, but it was coming out and reports were showing that Arkansas looks like they've got their man. A guy for the offensive line position, as we talked about last week, Cody Kennedy uh, moving on and becoming the Mississippi State offensive line coach. And questions were getting thrown around forever as far as what direction is Arkansas going to go with this. Well, this is uh, according to a report from the ESPN uh, college football writer, Adam Rittenberg. He says that Arkansas is expected to hire Baylor's offensive line coach, Eric Mateos. Now, some of you may have heard that name before, or I may be a little bit familiar with that name. Eric Mateos served under Sam Pittman uh, here at Arkansas, I believe, during the Bielema years and as a grad assistant. And he has also uh, coached some different places, like at LSU. He was the tight ends coach there. He was offensive line coach at Texas State, BYU, and at Baylor. So that looks to be the case, and I think it all makes sense. I think this was a name that a lot of people – Felt like because of the connection that he had with Sam Pittman. uh, This was one that actually I thought was going to be a hire that was made before even we got to this point. You know, because I just felt like it made sense because Sam Pittman's talked very highly of him and obviously knows Arkansas a little bit in his experience here. But uh, it's going to be looking like he's going to be the guy. So uh, he's been at Baylor. And some of you may have done some research on it and looked at it from the position of, uh, you know, how, how does he done at Baylor? You know, like how, how good has he been and, and, uh, and everything, which we'll talk about that, but I do want to play a few of these clips because this kind of shows a little bit of the background of, uh, Eric Mateos and not only him kind of as a person and the personality that he shows and, but also him breaking down some film, uh, in, in both paces. So what, let's hear from, uh, Eric Mateos and this is kind of him mic'd up at Baylor, uh, that has some uh, pretty humorous moments, but also shows off a little bit of his personality. They got me on the microphone today. Hey, Coach, oh. you get a part of that way? I don't care. It's the best day, Wes. You're going to get a lot of reps, man. Ready to go? I know you are. You got to go on live.com to get it. It's a good hat, man. It actually fits my head on like that hat. What is this? Are you posing as Prince? Are we supposed to think you're Prince? Are you Prince or Kaya? I don't know. Here we go. 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 Now, hey. Good. So, hey, get what I'm saying? I'll advise on protecting that ring. Yeah, I'm not wearing it no more. Don't you usually have a glove on your left hand? Yeah, I didn't wear it today. Huh. Came here so you could feature your athleticism. Here we are, featuring your athleticism. You know what they say when in doubt, throw it deep. So a little bit of a background, just kind of showing off his personality. He seems to be a humorous guy, good sense of humor. And also, if you just look at him, uh, you know, he's built like an offensive lineman. He's an offensive lineman guy. And, uh, you know, he's kind of almost looks like Cody Kennedy in a little bit with the, the beard and everything. But uh, as fun as it is showing off his personality, here's a little bit more of our, as far as him breaking down some film and uh, kind of giving you a, a background of how he looks at the game itself uh, while also he was at Baylor. Okay, who's not an O-lineman. So in this particular look, it's the running back. And so he gets that tag. He knows I'm the only guy that can be the archer here, so I'm the archer. And we also tell him, but we tell him that he's the archer by calling the running play a Q run. So if we say Q wide zone right uh, single, he knows, well, it's Q wide zone single, I'm the archer, okay? And, but if we would have called this... Um, 
hey, wide zone right with, uh, with Uno, that means that, hey, I'm carrying out the fake on the wide zone and the tackle is the one guy who's arcing. Does everybody kind of follow me on that? So we have all those design, those design arc tags. So this would be an example of an open side zone by the O-line, right? Guys get in the jet, we have one arcer. Again, that's a, that's a five-yard run, but if you want to have an offense where you run jets, let me go back to the wide here, and you fake jets, well, if you want to be an offense that fakes jets, you got to run jets, okay? And so it doesn't mean that you got to run them 25 times a game, but eventually people are going to catch on to your, to your, uh, to your little game plan deal where, hey, they don't ever hand the jet off, so people aren't going to pay any attention to the guy. So we're trying to protect that play too. All right, here's, now it's one arcer, all right? And we put a crack on it with the receiver. So it's just the tight end here arcing, all right? Again, is it a 20-yard run? No, but it's an efficient run. We're running wide zone the other way, all right? Here's a, now here's a play. Now we have put the, the two arcers on. So the O-line again is running wide zone, all right? Now we put a tag on for two arcers. One coaching point that I'll show from this angle and that we'll talk a little bit more about when we show an under center clip, is you can see the jet runner. Okay, number one, we hand these off. So I know it's cool to, uh, to what, what, I don't know even what to call, short pass or something. You know, toss these to the, to the guy in the jet motion. We hand these off. Uh, we believe in it. We practice it. We believe that it helps, helps the guy run in the jet, run it better rather than having to catch it. Um, but you'll see here when he's a shotgun, he's not losing any ground after the mesh. All right, he's catching this thing, all right, and he's trying to circle the defense, finds an opportunity to get a, a vertical cut and gets it. Just the effort that you get from your, from your arcers here is really good. And so the O-line right here, we know that there's a jet, but we don't really block it any differently if you're thinking about that question. We don't know because we're not trying to, we're not trying to, like we are on the freeze option, we're not trying to knock block. So it's just a little bit of him breaking down some film there and uh, talking about Baylor and everything. So gives you just a little indication of, you know, where his mindset's at. And uh, obviously he's got a great knowledge of everything as far as the offensive line play goes and fitting into the offense. Uh, but he's getting, been an experienced guy that's worked his way up. And I guess this is where it comes into play of for me. You know, if I, if I look at his numbers, like it, it's hard to like say, okay, as an offensive line coach, uh, if you didn't run the ball effectively, that means you're a poor O-line coach or, you know, whatever. Or I think it was the same thing even this year in sacks. I think Baylor ended up uh, being in the really bad space of giving up a lot of sacks, similar to Arkansas. I think they gave up 34 sacks this year. Arkansas gave up 47. So kind of give you a little bit of a uh, indication there too. But here's the thing is like, Am I going to try to sit here and say that, oh, my goodness, home run higher in the offensive line position? No, because, I mean, he listen, he's got he's a guy that's been experienced and has gone through a lot and uh, obviously having some experience with Sam Piven in Arkansas, that's good. But I can't sit here and just say, oh, well, man, this home run easily. We have to see more. And I think that that's kind of what, after the the Cody Kennedy experiment and what happened and also the, uh, the lack of, you can call it recruiting, you can call it evaluating talent or whatever it is, of the offensive line over the past few seasons, it's like, okay, you gotta, you gotta show something. We can't just, we can no longer do the whole thing of just giving the benefit of the doubt to Sam Pittman because he is the best O-line coach in the country. Therefore their line is going to be good. We can't do that anymore. So we have to see something. Now, is Eric Mateos going to be the guy? Don't know. Don't know. I'd like to see what he could do in the transfer portal and in the recruiting, but this is also something that he signed up for and signed off on with now that Petrino, of course, is running the offense. Pittman, hopefully, and I'm sure he did, got with Petrino and started talking about, all right, well, if we're going to move forward with the offensive line, here's what we're thinking. And I'm sure that it was something to where Pittman's like, I got this guy named Eric Mateos. Here's why I like him. Give it over to Petrino. Let Petrino see what he's done, what he's accomplished, and came to an agreement and said, hey, let's bring this guy in. So that's what I'm hoping for. And that's what I'm hoping for. But uh, Mateos did have a few things, like offensive lineman Connor Galvin there for Baylor uh, was named Offensive Lineman of the Year in the Big 12, in addition to being on the All-Big 12, uh, all Big 12 First Team, All-American First Team, and All-American Third Team uh, honors from different outlets there. So uh, also had center Jacob Gall, who was named All-American Second Team and All-Big 12 Second Team. 
And Xavier Newman Johnson was the third member of the offensive line to garner some postseason recognition as he was an honorable mention on all Big 12. So they at least had some guys that were recognized in the Big 12 uh, as far as uh, the play and as far as how how good they were. So we'll see. We'll see how it breaks out and how it how it happens. But I like the familiarity. I think that that's helpful. And again, I think Sam Pittman, hopefully, as, as much as like what Sam Pittman has learned as a head coach, I'm hopeful that now that this is a new thing that he's learning, he says, okay, we can't do what we did and have been doing on the offensive line. We can't just be going, rolling out the same guys. Like, we got to make some changes. We got to make some big moves here. And I'm hoping that he believes that uh, Mateos is the guy that can come in and make those big moves. And says they need help. They need to get into the portal. They need to bring in some dudes. And so hopefully that's the way it plays out. But it looks like Eric Mateos is going to be coming back to Arkansas as the offensive line coach uh, for the Razorbacks. And we'll see what other moves are being made on the side of uh, the offense and the coaching staff. Because I still don't think they're done just yet. Uh, but we'll talk about some updates with Razorback basketball uh, here in just a second. But folks... Got to tell you, when you are hiring for your small business, you want to have as many top-tier candidates as possible to interview, and that's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, because LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. It has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates, so easy, in fact, that the 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and may not have the time or the resources to hire, but thankfully with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so moving on into the next segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Uh, Razorback basketball, we know, had the big win over Duke last week and still flying high from that. But uh, the job's not finished. Job is not finished as they will be welcoming in Furman uh, coming in actually tonight in Bud Walton Arena. And this will be uh, it's interesting, interesting timing because... You think about it, like Arkansas played Duke last Wednesday, and they have their next game on a Monday. Like, it's weird. It's a, it's a weird concept. And then on top of that, their next game is against Oklahoma and Tulsa. It's going to be on Saturday. So quite a big gap in between the games, which, of course, has always been beneficial to Arkansas. But one of the biggest things and the questions I think most Razorback fans have is what is the update on Tremont Mark? Because we know that uh, he was dealing with some back issues after the uh, event down there in the Bahamas, and he didn't play against Duke. Now, they ended up winning without him, which was awesome, but there's no question that if you've watched Razorback basketball this year, you know how much of an impact Jermon Mark has. He's a big-time player, and they got to get him back on the court as uh, he may be arguably the best player on the team so far this year. Well, Eric Musselman met with the media. He was asked about Tremon Mark, and here's his update on his status. And then I know uh, it's only been a couple of days since we asked you about uh, Jermon, just wondering, is he able to do anything in practice? Or kind of what's the latest on him? Any shot he could play Monday night? Well, he, he did, you know, basically, even on his own, you know, yesterday, just nothing, you know, nothing there to report. Now, today, um, in, in uniform, um, went through some things that were non contact, uh, went through some things that were not going to be uh reactionary plays meaning things on defense um the concern right now is not the back the concern continues to be the hip and the groin um he did a lot more today than what i would have thought he would have done um and then we'll see see where he's at you know really tomorrow um to be honest with you i mean i think that you know tomorrow after after practice and then how he is at shoot around Monday will, will determine, um, you know, I would say that we, we feel very confident that he would play um, in the game after Monday um, okay. based, based on the progress. Monday is still up in the air. I would, I would, I would say, Bob. Yeah. I know you mentioned he had issues with his groin, his hamstring. Is that sort of all offshoots of his back kind of messing up the rest of his body or how, yep. I'm not a doctor, obviously. But neither am I. 
<laughs> but yes, I think after the aftershock of the back, you know, um, you know, the groin is, is, is the, is the most concerning amongst trainers, doctors, and player. So there's Eric Musselman updating everybody on Tremont Mark. And, you know, I, it's, I'm not trying to say it's good, but it is at least a little bit of more of an optimistic viewpoint of, it looks like he's going to be back at some point. Um, cause when he it ended up happening there in the Bahamas, it was a really scary moment, you know, obviously having to be stretchered out and, uh, you know, not really seeing much of him knowing it was a back issue. Cause, uh, for those of you who may have had back injuries or, uh, sore backs, whatever it is, like you can't do anything. Like I know that there's like, we, we don't want to ever get hurt or ever get injured, but like just, I have not had what happened with Tremont Mark, but I know that I had some, uh, like like a pinched nerve kind of in in my back before, man. And it, you're you are completely and totally useless. <laughs> like you can't do anything. Uh, everything hurts, and you can't sit. You can't lay. Like it just is a very awful experience. And so to hear that and hear must talk about that from Tremont Mark and knowing that it's about the aftershock, it's kind of amazing because you know again if you've experienced this before, there's a lot of cases where it does spread because at least I know in the injury that I had. It's like all the other, whenever there was the nerve and there was the issue, all the muscles kind of tensed in and tried to protect that nerve, that sore, that pulled muscle, whatever it is. And by doing that, it kind of puts in all your muscles from other areas and it just miscontorts you all over the place. So yeah, again, I'm not a doctor, but I just know that it, it is the aftershock that takes a little bit to get back from. So uh, we'll see if he actually plays tonight against Furman. Hopefully Arkansas doesn't even need him to play tonight. And I know that Muss is going to handle it the right way that he needs to handle it. But uh, it, I think everybody would be okay with Tremont Mark just hanging out against Furman, resting, trying to get back, and then get him ready for Saturday against Oklahoma over there in Tulsa. Because that's always a tricky game, as we know, but uh, should be a good one regardless. So, uh, But we'll, we'll talk about that as the week gets closer and the week goes on and recap the game, of course, tomorrow on the podcast and we're going to talk some college football because the playoff has been officially set and man has it been controversial uh but as the weather gets colder folks the nfl offers stay hot on FanDuel, and right now new customers get a 150 dollars back in bonus bets with any winning five dollar money line bet that's 150 bucks if your team wins if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get on the action than right now the app is so easy to use and there's a wide range of options including spreads player props and over-unders and so much more so visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. So uh, college football, as we know, has been... For all the different reasons that have been fun, controversial when it comes to postseason play and def deciding a champion. As much college football is my favorite sport, uh, I think it's a lot of your favorite sports. Uh, there's nothing better than Saturdays and tailgating <coughs> and all of that stuff. But uh, one of the things that they have just never gotten right has been postseason. And even though we've gotten closer to it, and I think it's gotten better, the four team playoff, it just ain't it. Because we know that it's going to be expanding to 12. And the reason expanding to 12 is because it's just, it's not as good. Like, it's not as good. And there's money and, and everything involved. But either way, odds are this will be the final year that they will have four teams. And expand it to 12. But this year, the four teams selected caused a lot of controversy. And rightfully so. Um, the four teams that were selected are Michigan, Washington, Texas, and Alabama. Now, let me be clear in saying this, that I believe Michigan and Washington are no-brainers. I think everybody agrees that those are no-brainers. I would even say, if it was my vote, because everyone's been giving out their own teams, that they got it right with putting in Texas and putting in Alabama. Just if we're going off of the best teams. Because you have the SEC champion in Alabama, and you have Texas, who has been pretty dominant, and the only loss that they had was to their rival, Oklahoma, at the very end of the game. And, you know, Alabama lost 
<laughs> it's like funny because it feels, seems like eons ago. <coughs> they lost to Texas uh, in, in a crazy game at home. But I don't think anyone necessarily has an issue with saying that those are the four teams that, like, they're, that someone else deserves it as far as the talent or like being the best team. But Florida State went undefeated this year. Undefeated. 13-0. They won the ACC. They won every game. And they had some good wins. And I think that also, considering the fact that they had two big-time non-conference opponents that they faced off against in one, when they beat LSU and Florida, two SEC teams, that you know they were very deserving of it. But the problem was is that they lost their quarterback uh, towards the end of the season, Jordan Travis. And he was he was incredible, but they ended up winning against Louisville. I think it was like 10 to 6. It wasn't exactly a high scoring game. And so they bumped Florida State out and they had Alabama jump in and Florida State is not going to the playoff. And they are they're irate about it. Like Florida State fans are mad, people in the media are mad. And you know, I get it. Trust me, I get it. Because imagine if that was an Arkansas thing. Like, imagine if this was Arkansas and they got left out after going undefeated. <coughs> We'd all be infuriated. So, I understand it. But here's the thing. This is why it needs to change. And why it needs to change quickly. And I think this is almost like a sacrificial lamb of, of Florida State just to get it to this next point where it's kind of like, yeah, it sucks for them. But, you know, this is the final year, so no, it's not going to be controversial anymore. It's not going to be... A problem anymore but I still again want to reiterate I believe that they got the right best four teams in but I still have always hated and this is what I've hated the most about college football in their postseason and championship thing college football at least FBS college football is the only sport at any level at any league anytime any place anywhere where sports competition takes place it is the only sport to where you can win every single game on your schedule and have no chance at winning a national championship. It's the only sport that you can do that in. In college basketball, no matter if you're you know, the 350th team when it comes to revenue and all that, if you win every single one of your games, you're going to get into the NCAA tournament and you're going to have a chance to win a championship. You're likely not going to, but you at least have the chance to. Same thing with baseball, soccer, volleyball. I mean, every sport across the board in every league, even football itself with NFL and high school. Like, if you win all your games, you're going to have a chance to win a title, to win a championship. And college football is the only one that has yet to get it right. And it's been frustrating for so many years because it's. I've always felt like it would have been a playoff thing a lot earlier if it just wasn't for the bowl games because of the amount of money that are in those bowl games. We all know that money controls so much and it's kind of getting pulled across and pulled together and everything. But I believe that is one of the biggest cases as to why it hasn't been there the way it's needed to be. So I feel for Florida State. I really do. Um, and if they had Jordan Travis healthy, like they would... They would probably be in the playoff. And I, I don't even think there would be a problem. I think they would 100% would be. So I understand it. I get it, and I feel for them. But, again, it's just the thing that's going to be talked about and everyone's upset about. But the best thing that could happen in this whole thing would be if Alabama can just go and win the championship, I think, because at least I would justify it. Uh, but yeah, even Georgia dropping from number one to number six. Isn't that crazy? Or number two, I guess what they were. To number six after one loss to Alabama. It's pretty brutal. So anyways, I I, know, I know everyone's given their two cents on it. But still, I, I feel for Florida State. I do. But they got it right. Let's just hope that this is the final year we ever have to do this. Final year we're ever going to talk about it. And get to a point to where if you win your conference... At least in the major conferences, you should get an automatic qualifier and hopefully they figure this thing out because this committee stuff and nonsense has been pretty dumb. So let's hope that they finally can get closer to getting it right. It's been so annoying. Either way, 
Appreciate everybody listening in to Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at Buzz John Neighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.